All right, um, it's 4.03, so uh, we can officially begin uh, the healthcare committee meeting. I appreciate everyone coming together. I know it kind of tastefully put together at the end of last week, trying to juggle the date earlier this week. Um, I apologize for that, but I do thank you for coming today. I know that we had wanted to get some time for the HSTP project team um, to discuss more updates since we ran out of time in our last meeting in early March. So first I'll pull up the um, meeting agenda for today. Um, so I have it up on my side. Um, okay, great. Thank you. All right, so uh, it's pretty straightforward today. Um, we can do a brief introduction. We'll appoint a secretary. We'll go through the meeting minutes from the last meeting. We'll open the floor to the project team to discuss their update. Um, if there's anybody from the public that's here, we'll make time for them to talk. And then we'll just got the timeline for the next meeting. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, Brett Hayes, I am a commissioner on the board and also the healthcare community of SharePoint. And then you want to move on to Ernest. Oh, I am Ernest Covington III. I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Commission on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. How you doing, Ernest? Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it. And then we have Alex. Good morning, Alex LaFerrier. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm the Outreach Coordinator for HSTP, and I'm excited to present on some data today. <laughs> we can't wait. We're looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, Christine? Hi, Christine West, Project Director for uh, Healthcare System Transformation Project. Uh, nice to see you today. You too, thank you. Uh, Bethany? Bethany Link, um, co Contract Project Coordinator for the Commission. Great, thank you. Especially thank you for your work with the, the meeting and to share on the screen. A little tedious, but we're really grateful. Um, and then I believe Carmen is also here today. Good afternoon, Carmen, Rhode Island Department of Health, um, Disability and Preparedness Specialist. Thank you for joining today, Carmen. I believe we are, great. I believe we also have Bumi, good I see you. And then we also have Michelle. Hi, good afternoon, Michelle Zylin from the Office of Healthy Aging. I'm the Associate Director. Nice to see you today, Michelle. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I think Bumi is here, but um, if she is still muted, uh, we can probably go ahead and get started. Um, I'm happy to continue the tradition of being the um, Secretary for the meeting and summarize what comes from the meeting. And if I can get the transcript from Bethany, I die over to. I will send that to you after the meeting. Thank you. And then next, um, I put together a brief summary of the meeting minutes from the last meeting we had, the March 9th meeting, uh, when we had um, a colleague from the School for the Deaf uh, come her name, Penny Berry, that was it, Penny Berry. Sorry, I'm terrible with names. Um, yeah, so um, I, I'm i not sure, Bethany, do you have a copy you can share or would you like me to send it to everybody? A copy of the minutes, I can share screen with the minutes. Well, before you do that, let's say Caroline joined us. I think you're on mute. Sorry, I'm late. That's okay. You were probably out walking in this beautiful weather, were you? No, I was downstairs feeding my dog. Ah, nice. <laughs> well, good to see you. Yeah. All right. Um, and then now we can probably start to look at the meeting minutes from the March 9th meeting.
Uh, I believe I had the people who attended the meeting, uh, Caroline, myself, James, Jim Bumi from the committee, uh, Penny Bailey was the guest, and then the staff that I attended was Christine, Alex, Bethany, Co um, Ernest, and Pam. And I believe Joan and Simon were also our interpreters for the meeting. And then uh, moving down to bullet point three, Christine made some update to the meeting minute draft copy from the January 12th meeting. We've already submitted that back to the commissioned office, who should be out set there. And then um, the main um, the main event of the meeting was when Penny Bailey from the Wood Island School for the Deaf joined up. And it was a pretty fascinating presentation around a survey project that she did uh, around um, her healthcare assets for the student body uh, with the student and the parents of the student. And I, I didn't go step by step what she talked about. I kind of summarized it. And Penny offered to um, share the presentation that we can submit a copy to the commissioner's office for our own record. Um, I, I did call out a few parts um, talking about the contentions around students uh, eager to be a part of the conversation in the healthcare setting. A lot of time they are overlooked um, and taken over by the parent in the room uh, with the doctor or another healthcare employee. Uh, I talked, uh, touch upon a Q&A session that we had with Penny based on her finding. And Penny has offered to come back to the healthcare committee meeting in the future if there are any conversations we want to have or continue to have from her finding or any future project that you might feel we can get good information from her. And then unfortunately we did not have enough time to really go through any project update last month. So there wasn't much to add in this session. Um, I know we briefly touched upon the interpreter program with Dr. Lynch and that uh, Alex and Christine had mentioned they wanted to share all of the survey results for the next meeting which is today. And then I believe Ernest he touched upon a COVID-19 vaccination program communication um, at the time, which was a critical topic to get communication and awareness to the deaf and hard of hearing community. And then we offered a public comment and then we ended the meeting at 5.31. Does anybody have any questions or objections? All right. Well, uh, if there's no update, um, I will I will revise this one more time, run it through it, and draft a final copy to send over to uh, Pam and Ernest and Bethany. All right, thank you. And we can probably stop sharing that now and then go back to the meeting minute. Point number four, progress update around the HSTP project. Um, I'm happy to give the floor now to the project team, Alex and Christine. Um, is there something you would like to touch upon first? Yes. Um, yeah, before we dive into the data, I just wanted to give you a brief project update on what's been happening and most specifically um, the project website. Um, I'd like to bring that up for you on the screen just to make you aware that that website uh, has been created. And so whatever it is that we don't cover in today's meeting for the data for both of the surveys, uh, you can uh, find on your own uh, at the website. So I just want to share my screen um, with you to um, show you what that looks like. Uh, 
And hopefully folks can see that. Uh, so this is our HSTP website. Uh, you can find it at cdhh.ri.gov slash HSTP. Um, and as you can see uh, across the top, uh, we have our home landing page, uh, which we have here. Uh, please feel free to, to take a look. Um, we also have um, our three tabs here for our three project goals. So we have data collection, and that includes national and state data. Uh, including a timeline of uh, health surveillance that's been done uh, throughout the state regarding the deaf and hard of hearing community. We also have our survey for Rhode Island healthcare professionals that Alex will be going into. Uh, and we also have our survey for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Uh, for our second goal, we have workforce training. Uh, and you can see some of the activities that we're working on there. And then finally, workforce development with the sign language interpreter program. So just wanted to make committee members aware of the website. So um, during your free time, if you want to take an additional look uh, at what we've been doing, um, all of the information is here. Um, the second update I wanted to provide is uh, both Alex and I had the wonderful opportunity to present to Perspectives Corporation uh, both yesterday and today. So we've been very busy with that. Uh, yesterday afternoon, we did a two hour presentation with deaf and hard of hearing staff there, um, uh, including their full uh, um, staff for the deaf and hard of hearing programs. Uh, and then we also presented again this morning from nine to 11. Uh, to perspectives and it was very well received and we were very happy to have the opportunity to uh, present to those folks there and share a little bit more about the project. Um, I also wanted to share about uh, the interpreting program. Uh, the program has been officially approved by the post-secondary ed council. Um, so even though uh, the grant outlined establishing an interpreting program for the community, it wasn't officially approved till just a week or two ago by the post-secondary ed council. Uh, so we have the green light to move ahead uh, with it. We've been working very hard uh, and we do have some additional updates in terms of uh, marketing uh, as well as continued program development. But we wanted to share the news with you that it is official. Uh, it has been approved and uh, we're looking forward to <clears throat> additional progress on that. There are actually three programs that uh, have been approved uh, related to interpreting. One program for ASL interpreters, one for Spanish interpreters and one for Portuguese interpreters. So three brand new interpreting programs uh, at RIC. So we're excited to be uh, amongst those folks and look forward to some cross collaboration with those spoken language interpreters as we move forward. Uh, so just wanted to share those brief updates before we dive into the data. Um, what we can do first, I guess, is start off with Alex, if you want to talk about the um, um, survey for healthcare professionals that we sent out. Would you like me to bring it up on the website or did you want to bring it up on your end, Alex? Uh, we can see what it looks like on the website. I figured we would go okay. through each okay. slide, each, each portion. Sure, great. Is the website live? I'm sorry? Is the website live? Yes, now? it is live. Yep, yep. Awesome. You can go ahead and access it. Yep. Um, and before we get to the, um, the surveys, I just want to point out under national and state data, as you know, we were required to compile some baseline findings. Uh, so what we did was uh, compiled a timeline, as I mentioned, of previous research data and surveys that were conducted uh, in the state uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing community. And all those are broken down by year. Um, so you have a timeline uh, going all the way back to 1982 with um, Jeannie Panarace, for those of us who were around uh, back then. Um, and then it continues on into the future. So you can see that timeline uh, all the way up uh, until present day. And uh, so I hope folks will feel free to take a look at that information because uh, we finally have it archived. Um, as opposed to being in separate files at the commission, we have one consolidated place where uh, we can uh, archive this information. So I hope folks will take a look at it um, during your free time. So jumping into the survey for Rhode Island healthcare professionals, we will jump into the survey results. All yours, Alex. Sure thing. Can we zoom in a little bit, try to fill sure. the screen? I figured we okay. would go a little bit more if we could, please. I want it nice and big. Okay. So as Christine mentioned, we're warmed up 
after presenting to perspectives, we didn't do a deep dive. We started to scratch the surface. So healthcare committee is lucky that we're ready to present in full force. We're gonna, this data is gonna take us on a little journey and it starts off with demographics. So I figure it's gonna look like a graph and then the graphs will be broken down into deeper options. So with this first one, uh, we are looking at the demographics of what the survey participants are. And we can look down at the breakdown in which 23% uh, the majority, ironically enough, are other. Where the one we're most concerned with is uh, doctors and nurses, which make up about 50%. So begs the question, success is one of the first things I've noted to myself. We've reached 50% doctors and nurses, which I think is very critical for our healthcare system transformation project. And then the to break down the other even more so, if we can continue scrolling, these are just a slice of what the others break down into with a majority being social workers. This is the line by line item of every other uh, contribution. But the next is social workers at 16%, psychologists at 8%. So you're, you're looking at a, a span of uh, uh, healthcare workers like I mentioned earlier, 50% being doctors and nurses, and then the next breakdown being social workers and psychologists. So that's going to frame a lot of our thinking as we move forward to imagine one out of every two answers is from a doctor or a nurse at 50%, which is great to think about because that's, that's our target audience here. Great. Thank you, Alex. I just wanted to add to this. When you look at the other, uh, we have quite um, uh, a range of uh, healthcare professionals that are responding from, um, as, as Alex mentioned, doctors, nurses, um, we've got uh, social workers, physical therapists, hospital administrators, um, certified nurse midwives, um, uh, CAT scan, x-ray technologists, um, program managers, psychologists, um, firefighters and EMTs. So we have first responders, we have pharmacy technicians, um, respiratory therapists, massage therapists, dentist hygiene, dental hygienists. Um, so it, it goes on and on. It's nice to have uh, a quite a range of individuals who are responding. It even shows the success of the survey reaching beyond non-healthcare fields, which is a great start in terms of making change in other areas, but that's beyond the scope of this project right now. Uh, eventually we'll get to question number two. We just keep scrolling all past Getting all there. Here we go. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else sees that. It's frozen on my end. Uh, I can see it. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Can folks see it? It appears frozen, Christine. I can't yeah, see it. Right Hold on. Let me see. Let me bring that back up. Sorry, that might have been too fast. Is that okay? It's getting there. Taking a moment. I've been having technical problems today, so. Folks able to see that yet? Mm, no, Alex, yet. Not no, yet. No. Alex, did you want to bring it up on your end? Sure. Okay. I have some slides here, which is what I was planning. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here. I think people should be able to see this. Is that is that correct? Yep, we can do it. So here's how I was going to go through it with my slides. It's obviously more encompassing on the website where you see each line by line item here. This is compiled down into social workers at 16%, like I said. Okay, so if we move on, uh, my primary place of work is in. Here's the nice graph where it shows the percentages broken down visually. And if we look here in the numerical breakdown, hospitals and other are the two leading uh, places of work, which is great for our healthcare uh, survey concerns. And if we go down to look at what those others broke down into, Schools is, our, is the number one other choice. 
than nursing homes and retired. I'm not going to go into every line and discuss everything. I've written specific notes on specific slides because we have uh, 58 points of data to go through. So for the sake of this meeting, we're just going to look and then I'm going to make a comment and then extrapolate where needed. But just to give you an idea, we're looking at 50% doctors and nurses uh, that take place at 50% in the hospital. So this is framing our data. Which, which county are you located in? Visually, predominantly yeah. Providence. Big city data, big city progress. Um, doesn't speak to a, large of the a lot of the counties outside of the city. So something to keep in mind. These are progressively minded city dwellers that are uh, aware of this survey and answering accordingly. followed by Kent, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I am a female, large representative here of our data. So these doctors and nurses, or at least the ones that are responding are 78% female respondents, which is sort of in tandem to a lot of deaf community, uh, uh, deaf culture norms. Uh, the large predominance of female workers in deaf culture and deaf community I wonder if this is uh, reflective of some sort of gendered norm where a female uh, mindset has a tendency to want to engage and share data as opposed to the male mindset that maybe is a little less receptive or less engaged with data uh, or willing to share at least, especially in a healthcare field, which, which, is, which is predominantly uh, uh, dominated by men. This is quite a surprising uh, response. You would imagine the male population would be a lot more respondent when 50% of it are doctors and nurses. But just something to keep in mind, these female doctors and nurses in Providence, so on and so forth. So this is expanding our story as we continue forward. My age is in a, a beautiful bell curve here of age distribution, centered around 50 and 59%. And if we look at the percentages, not as, not as easily uh, visually displayed, but I, my note here is uh, 50 to 59 percent makes sense for a healthcare field, which is a largely uh, older population of employment and doctors need a lot of education and that's a, a field that requires a lot of maturity and so on and so forth. But it, it will reflect the mindset of people who have some willingness or are willing to admit their understanding of deaf culture and it may not be indicative of the larger uh, youth or progressive mindset that exists in a, in a, in a more uh, youthful environment. So this I think is a good thing to, to recognize um, that the survey respondents are showcasing knowledge from over the course of 50 years as opposed to a more modern progressive mindset of a youthful mindset. I also noted that we had point 1.3% uh, of 90 plus. So uh, two respondents were over 90, never stop learning. Thank you for those respondents who are willing to engage even in their later years of life. So that's, I thought that was kind of neat to have in our survey. Okay, have you had prior exposure to deaf or hard of hearing people? Resounding over 90%, which is, which is great. This is uh, a big step. You would imagine ha having the opposite answer would be a very, terrible thing to, to have to engage because, oh my goodness, there are deaf people in the world and how come over 90% haven't engaged them at all? I, I would admit that, is this a broad question though? Um, exposure in the movies, on TV, in your life? So take the 90% of exposure to deaf or hard of hearing people with a grain of salt, you know? I've, I saw switched at birth. I have exposure to the deaf community. I'm good to go. Is not necessarily a yes answer we want to, we want to, uh, uh, chalk up as success. So keep that in mind. Has there ever been a deaf or hard of hearing person in your social circle? A little bit more in, uh, uh, alluding to people's day-to-day -day interaction. And this is split, almost 50-50, 52-47. Uh, this is interesting to know. Yes, uh, there's a 10% split. So 90% uh, uh, Deaf or hard appearing, making their way in people's lives. Reading my note here needs to be a little bit refined. So consider one out of every thousand, one out of every thousand babies born are deaf or hard of hearing, would make this kind of an interesting statistic in which ninety percent of uh, people said no, that they don't.
So are you aware that there is a deaf culture? Yes, that's a good answer. That's great. That means deaf culture has a presence here in our state of Rhode Island and the cities, according to the female doctors and nurses of Providence. Have you taken American Sign Language class? No, predominant answer, which is, that's unfortunate. That's a sad thing because we would love to have more people take American Sign Language class for the sake of humanity and the sake of our Rhode Island deaf community. But at the same time, a predominant deaf culture theme, never taken ASL, but I would love to is a resounding yes. I could just add to that, Alex. I think that's an interesting point that we have, uh, what, 70% of healthcare providers who want to take an ASL class. So I think we see opportunity there that if that kind of capacity could be provided to them somehow, uh, providing ASL classes uh, to nurses, to doctors, uh, if that were ever to present itself, that's a great opportunity because it sounds like people want it. Right, maybe they just don't have the formal avenue or resource or ability to take a, a well-structured, well-focused class. So that's, that's great to point out that the demand is there. We just need to provide the supply. Right. Here's just the numerical breakdown. So do you know how to request a sign language interpreter? Almost 60% says said yes. So that's a great thing to know is our doctors and nurses in the city of, of Providence around the ages of 50 to 59 know how to request a sign language interpreter. I just wanted to add, we have almost 41% who do not know how to request a sign language interpreter. And so I think there's uh, opportunity there too for some more education about um, knowing how to go about requesting interpreters. And as we know with Penny in her presentation uh, last time, uh, talked about parents and not knowing the process and coming up with that uh, infographic that she made. Uh, so again, more opportunity for education on behalf of the commission um, with healthcare providers. Right, it would be an ultimate goal to get that to 100% know how to. And we are rid of 40%, almost 41% that do not know how to, especially in a healthcare setting. Hi, uh, this is Brett. Um, do you think that is more of a, um, is that more on the provider, like the, the, the company that that provider works for, or is that more on the provider themselves, the healthcare provider? to learn that, did that make sense? <laughs> I believe it would be the onus of a healthcare provider to know how to request a sign language interpreter. That, that, is, that is a must. And uh, we are working on those training modules that one, address that it's the responsibility of a healthcare worker to request an interpreter, two, how to go about that through formal channels, through the commission and uh, services that the commission refers to, so on and so forth. So do they know how to request a sign language interpreter? Sure, does that mean they know how to do it through the commission? We don't know that specifically. Do they know how to call up an interpreter agency through informal channels? Like that's, that's we wanna clarify that. We wanna actually bring clarity to that. Yeah, and also to add uh, to that, each facility may have a different policy and procedure in terms of requesting interpreters. So do these healthcare providers know and are they familiar with their site specific procedures? Do they contact the uh, interpreter services office within the hospital, or if that doesn't exist, if it's a primary care physician, do they know how to reach out um, to uh, appropriate agencies to make that request? I think the most important thing is, do these individual healthcare providers know the processes within their own facilities, even though those facilities may vary in their processes? Right. And, and maybe the doctor says, yes, I know how I, I ask my secretary, but does the secretary know how or, you know, th th that's not solving the problem. So this answer might actually be a little bit skewed and no is actually a larger percentage. It's just misrepresented because of one's error in, in knowledge. So th that's a lot of things that we need to address. And this is Carol and jumping in just for a minute. I, I need to go back. I, I don't need you to go back on the slide, but I'm referring back. So a significant proportion of people said they had never met a deaf or hard of hearing person. Considering the high prevalence of hard of hearing, I'm just shocked. And um, I know that being hard of hearing is kind of 
even in some ways more invisible than being deaf, but it makes me wanna wrap them across the knuckles because you know they have people in their lives, their families, their friend circle who are hard of hearing. So shame on them. Mm. Yes. Do you think that might be the misinterpret misinterpretation of what a deaf and hard of hearing individual is? Do you think maybe they don't realize that might also include family members with hearing damage from music or late deaf and do they, do you think well, it's a possibility they're not considering that? Sure, Brett. And I think it shows that you're a much nicer person than I am. I'm a little more militant about this because <laughs> it just uh, irritates me no end. No, I, a, I was, I was afraid. Very, yeah. Sorry. That, yeah, that's a very deep philosophical question of identifying deafness and that's beyond the scope of this project right now. No, I know, I know. But I, but I wanna make sure that as a hard of hearing person, I'd like us all to be represented. Um, Absolutely. And, and I know that sometimes it's something as simple as the doctor not turning his or her back when they talk to you, that kind of thing. So. Uh, yeah, I think you bring up a good point, Caroline, about what is the perception of medical providers in terms of looking at deaf and hard of hearing people? Who do they consider? Uh, to be a part of this group. And if they're not considering certain people to be a part of this group, why is that? Um, what's informing those perceptions and those in that kind of decision-making? Um, and there's room opportunity for training there as well. Right, I think a lot of people think if your speech is clear, you're not deaf or hard of hearing. Right, right. Right. All right, we're gonna progress along. Bye. It's okay. Uh, are you aware of the difference between sign language interpreters and certified deaf interpreters? A big resounding no, and that's quite unfortunate. Uh, maybe a byproduct of CDIs becoming a recent phenomenon in the past couple decades. So, you know, Gal, uh, playing devil's advocate here, but this is this is a huge issue that needs to be addressed as CDIs are critical, especially in a healthcare field uh, where there's very specific terminology and very specific cultural understanding to transmit to the variety of, of deaf community members. So this 83% is, is, uh, is an unfortunate statistic. Yeah, and just to add to what uh, Alex um, uh, said very well, in fact, um, certified deaf interpreters are actually the original interpreters. Uh, they have been working as interpreters since um, the dawn of man and, and, and women. So they were the original interpreters. Hearing interpreters are the, the newbies to the, to the field. Um, as we know that deaf individuals have served as interpreters for their own um, classmates uh, growing up at schools for the deaf when they were unable to understand uh, hearing teachers. Um, and so we know that CDIs are the original interpreters in the field. And the fact that we have healthcare workers who don't understand the difference between a hearing and a deaf interpreter and understand the value of a CDI and what a CDI can bring to that particular healthcare um, event, uh, I think is really important and merits uh, a lot of education. And this might not even speak to the bias in, inside the mindset of a deaf person cannot be an interpreter. A certif the, 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 the quote certified deaf interpreter, we know it hopefully to be a, a deaf individual who is serves as an interpreter, but this very well could be read as simply an interpreter that I assume is hearing. They are a certified deaf interpreter. You know, so that's, and even if it was, even if it was perceived as a norm, normal quote unquote he, hearing interpreter, there's still 83% willing to admit they do not know what that means. Right. Okay, moving on. Uh, we're starting to get in some meat of the matter here. Are you aware of video relay service? Almost 60% says they, they do not, they are not aware of video relay services which is unfortunate, Never mind not having access to uh, CDIs as a, a resource or an understanding. Now we're getting into the technological misunderstanding of having the ability to provide interpreters via relay or well, communicating, co connecting via relay services to deaf patients abroad. This isn't VRI, we're getting to that next, but to know that they cannot even connect to the deaf community via VRS, video relay services or video technology to communicate with them directly. Yeah, agreed. And this is important when a deaf individual is trying to schedule an appointment with a physician or trying to call into the hospital to get information. 
And if we have folks who uh, are working in those facilities that don't understand VRS, don't understand when they're getting a call from a deaf person and decide to hang up, um, obviously that causes frustration on the part of the deaf consumer. So we can see where there's more opportunities for education here too. Right, and, and the pr uh, practices and protocol that go into using VRS, whether that's pacing or understanding the, the intermediary and what is actually happening in that pipeline, which again, our uh, um, workforce training modules address very visually, which is, which is great. So here's the numbers here. And I also brought up as well too, which is unfortunate because uh, technology has has developed on thanks to the deaf community for numerous years. And I wrote down, you know, does anyone remember the Sidekick, the precursor to pagers and smartphones? And we have the deaf community to thank for for this sort of technology. So even in the medical field, which is a constantly evolving medical uh, or a technological field, they are not aware of the VRS as a service. So it's unfortunate. And here we are again yeah, with VRI, over a resounding 60% no. So never mind knowing that we can communicate through video technology with our patients. We, we do, not, do not even know we can provide interpreting access in the healthcare field through technology. And that's a huge uh, knowledge gap as well too. Okay, now we're getting into the services. Are you aware of Are you aware of the commission here in Rhode Island? Over fifty percent say yes, but more importantly, almost fifty percent say no, which is 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 very problematic. This is a, a valuable resource here in Rhode Island and one that mediates in between the community and healthcare providers in terms of resources across the spectrum. It would be nice if our cities, if our hospitals and uh, doctors and nurses knew about the commission. I'm sure it would alleviate maybe a lot of their concerns with trying to provide interpreters or learning about VRI, VRS, et cetera. Especially yeah, Sorry, go for it, Kristen. Sure, and just to add to that, even knowing about the EPCAP program, uh, which uh, was created and, and exists in order to provide training to healthcare providers, uh, among others, including first responders. So knowing that this resource is available for future training opportunities, that would be important too. A cochlear implant, don't know. We'll get to the next one. It's a little easier to read. So a cochlear implant, will allow, you can read it here for yourself. A majority of people believe a cochlear implant, they don't know what it does, which is maybe the safer answer, but a little bit more shocking. The next answer is okay. number one, will allow a deaf adult to immediately begin hearing and understanding oral conversations at 400 respondents, 26%. So that's that's very shocking to think that healthcare providers, doctors and nurses in the city of Providence, Rhode Island, believe that a cochlear implant will immediately do this for a deaf individual. And the you know, converse 16% thinks it will destroy hearing, any residual hearing that a patient have, has had left, which I believe might be technically true, but it's interesting that they that that has collected 240 responses. Hey, um, Alex, if you don't mind me asking, um, what's the point of this question? Is it like to see what they think they know the answer to cochlear yeah. implant? So the instrument uh, that we had borrowed from the University of California, San Diego, led by Dr. Georgia Sadler who built this tool in order to gauge deaf culture competency of healthcare providers. So this tool was very critical for us because that's exactly what we wanted to gauge here in Rhode Island to better see what the current understanding of deaf culture abroad and specifically here in terms of technology to better address where their knowledge gaps are. So if you know, 100% of people says, you know, corrects for any type of hearing loss, we can interject with our modules and say it does X, Y, and Z, or is desired by 100% you know, people think it's desired by 90% of deaf people, we can step in and say X, Y, and Z. So the answer here being 45%, they don't specifically know, that means our, our uh, workforce training module will address 
the spectrum of answers here and why one is more correct than the other or why one is, is not 100% truthful for the sake of their knowledge and how to better address it when the concern is brought up among patients, when the concern is brought up amongst parents. So they're better able to answer these questions more truthfully for the sake of the community long-term. Oh, Alex, I need to correct something I may have misunderstood. I thought that when a cochlear implant is implanted, that the ear that is implanted does lose any residual hearing. I thought the acoustic nerve was cut. Is that incorrect? I believe that is the correct answer for this question, Caroline. So they do lose it in the ear that's, in the ear that's been so-called treated. That's my understanding, correct. Okay. I believe right, that good. is... That is the correct answer for this question. Yeah, that that the shoe that drops when you try to go for a cochlear implant. If you have some natural hearing now, that you lose it all together and you lose the risk. And if it doesn't work at the cochlear implant, then you lose everything. Right. right. But um, as Alex was saying, you can see from the results of this survey, from the responses that only 15% of healthcare workers understand that. Uh, and you can see that most, as he said, don't we know what a cochlear implant does and how it impacts any residual hearing that the patient might have had. Uh, there's an assumption that 12% uh, um, by 12% of, of healthcare workers that at least 90% of deaf people desire a cochlear, a cochlear implant. Um, and that 26%, 400 individuals think that a cochlear implant will allow a deaf adult to immediately begin hearing and understanding oral conversations. Uh, and we know that there's a lot of work that happens post-surgery with mapping uh, and speech therapy uh, before someone can begin um, to do that. So we can see that there's a lot of misunderstanding out there, even amongst medical professionals who you might assume would know a lot about cochlear implants. What we're seeing is that there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. Right, and the survey clearly stated, if you do not know, please select do not know for the sake of our understanding. So people confidently selected A, will immediately allow a deaf individual. So that's 26%, which is a staggering result. All right, moving on. Uh, in a medical setting, it is the deaf, uh, is the right of the deaf patient to answer two here, which we'll expand upon is the leading answer to be provided with an interpreter by the practitioner. So that, that that's a comforting statement that almost 75%, obviously we would love that to be a 100%, but we're more interested in the 12% that don't know the rights of the deaf patient. You know, right. that, that, that needs to be corrected. I think with this question too, there is the possibility of a couple of other answers that could have been chosen. Um, it is the right of a deaf patient to express a preference for a particular interpreter. They do have that right to some extent. It doesn't mean that the healthcare provider must provide that particular interpreter, but they certainly have the right to express it. And certainly the deaf patient can decide how much personal information they want to disclose in an interpreted situation as well. So for this particular question, um, even though number two is considered the correct answer, um, both the first choice and the third choice could also um, be pop, could be considered quote unquote right answers as well. Right, it's just interesting to see where the data falls to yeah. see what are people more, most likely to believe in or pursue or, or elevate. Yeah. Well, and I, I also would wonder, I wonder if you've got to a question about whether uh, providers understand about certified interpreters, because I have seen family members put themselves forth as interpreters or neither screen nor certified people putting themselves forth as interpreters. The deaf person may prefer them, but I would think the medical provider would want the qualified person if only to protect their own um, professional integrity, not open themselves up to liability. Right. There is. There will be a question that addresses using a family member. Great. Thanks. Yep. So this next one's a bit of a long one. In a nutshell, it's addressing deaf culture. What is the best way to gain a deaf 
room's attention. And if we expand upon it, number three is the leading answer here. Our healthcare professionals believe that you should ask the interpreter to sign that you are ready to begin. I believe the most deaf culture answer is number two, flick the lights to gain people's attention. So it's interesting to see the interpreter become a, a, a device or a tool here or a position of authority. Uh, not necessarily wrong. It just seems interesting that healthcare providers are more willing to utilize the other human subject in the room to, to do what they could easily do themselves mm -hmm. by you know flicking their hands or flicking the lights. So I think this just summarizes a, a lack in deaf culture knowledge. Yep. Okay, moving on. Um, let's see here. Another deaf culture question, where sh should the patient and interpreter sit? So number two here is the leading answer. I believe number three, oh, sorry. No, you're right, that is the leading answer. But I believe the correct answer is um, the equal distance. Right. I don't know. Okay, moving on. If you have a deaf couple who refuse their newborn baby's hearing tested, yeah, who refuse to have their newborn baby's hearing tested, you should split here between don't know and number two. Inform them that is it is their decision, but explain that this lack of knowledge will put their baby at risk. I think the the other answers are far more fascinating that gain attention, you know, that it is required by law or accept their decision it seems to be the, the, the trailing answers. And doctors are led with the concern of, of risk, even though allowing them their decision. I just think that's very indicative of a pathological sort of mindset as opposed to respecting people's wishes. And then obviously don't know is, is a leading factor as well maybe the safest of all three answers. So maybe healthcare providers have a way out of saying they don't know rather than picking the wrong one. But nevertheless, almost 40% pick number two. All right, moving on. So you're in the emergency department. Call for a patient several times. Others in the emergency department reading a magazine, they tell you she's deaf. You should... Deaf culture, 101. Number three here gets the answer. Approach the patient, making small gestures. It's good. But I still think it's it's interesting. You know, people are willing to just call their name louder. I guess that is indicative of their willingness to use that option. 14% don't know. And I think, you know, there's also the approach of gently tapping on the shoulder, um, which could be the more effective um, answer in this case. Uh, certainly you could have either. You could have uh, gently tapping someone on the shoulder or you could have someone making small gestures in the field of vision. So here again is another question where you could have uh, some answers in both categories. And we can see that um, the highest number of responses were in both of those um, choices. All right, moving on. <clears throat> so just give me time to read the question here. You have a child documented hearing loss risk factor they require to receive additional follow-up testing. You should, predominant answer, explain to parents the importance of receiving hearing screening follow-up. That's best medical practice. That's probably the overwhelming answer for a reason. But again, we have almost 20% don't know. I still think that gives is, is sort of an out, but at least we know there are people who are, who are willing to admit ignorance as opposed to uh, feign knowledge. Here's a fascinating one. So the question, only 30% of English language can be accurately lip read. Our 1500 medical care providers don't know overwhelmingly don't know. 
probably because when a question asks a very specific number, if you want to game the game, you it can't possibly be true because it's a specific number. But point being is they're not willing to go true or false one way or another. And I think if this was the mainstream perspective of only 30% of English can be read on the lips, that is a, that could be a quote unquote true statement, but they aren't willing to admit that specific fact. So I, I almost am glad that they aren't willing to, to say that it is true one way or another. Uh, Alex, just, I didn't want to interrupt, but um, I see in the chat room that we have a reminder that the interpreter is scheduled till five o'clock. Okay. It is 4.53. So we have about seven minutes left. Okay. Um, We're only halfway through these slides. I knew this was a big chunk of data. So uh, if we all want to know what to do, I'm willing to silently just scroll through each slide for the sake of us having exposure to it. But I know each one can have a discussion in length. I think the other thing we can do is if folks want to take a look at it on the website on their own, and then at our next meeting, if there are any follow-up questions, we'd be happy to answer them at, at that time. Um, that might just save us a little bit here in terms of the time that we have left. Okay. Yeah, so I'm to schedule another meeting um, sooner than later. Like uh, if you want another hour to look at the data again. Um, I guess that's up to you, um, along with the committee members, is how much you would like to um, go through the data together and be able to talk about it, or if, or if you feel confident in looking at the data on your own and during our next meeting uh, discussing it, then it's up to you uh, in terms of how you want to approach. What would be most helpful to you? I think for me, um, I would probably want to look at the data before the meeting and then we can all um, come together and talk about what we can take away from this data and how we can interpret, how we can turn it into action between the committee and the commission. Yeah, I think for our project purposes, we are acting on this data already. You know, it's it's nice for us to report out, but HSTP is 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 focusing in on knowledge gaps, you know, ingesting, incorporating this data. It's it's you know driving our actions from here on out. It's great for the healthcare committee and the commission to know about it, but you know we can walk through it and have these discussions, which which I think are informative. But that HSTP is is moving full force ahead, which is which is great on this data. Yeah, and just to add to what Alex said, um, we took the results of this particular survey that he just shared and we identified the knowledge gaps. And now we're in the process of compiling a series of virtual trainings that will be made available to healthcare providers in response to these knowledge gaps. And you can take a look on our website under workforce training. You can look at uh, virtual trainings for healthcare providers. And there are 12 different trainings that we have compiled. Uh, so uh, we're in the process of creating those trainings. Alex is, is knee deep in editing them um, and we'll have them interpreted in captions so they are accessible to everybody. Uh, so that was a part of the uh, project deliverable is that we use this survey as baseline, identify where the knowledge gaps are, address those gaps through workforce training, and the results will also be included in that final consolidated report that we will also uh, be making. With the uh, uh, three minutes that we have left, I just want to give you some uh, brief, a brief overview of the deaf and hard of hearing survey. Um, okay. uh, and so I'm going to uh, go through it really fast. So bear with me, Tina. Um, our sample consisted of 105 deaf and hard of hearing adults. As you know, the survey had two different parts. The first part, we had 130 respondents. Um, and then the second part, we had 101 respondents. However, this sample consists of 105, uh, and that's due to the fact that we had to account for variables uh, that had at least a 90% response rate. Uh, however, that sample size is significant. We had a mean age of 49 years old, and that age range spanned from 18 to 86 years old. Uh, the sample consisted of 61% female, in 38% male and 1% non-binary. 
we had about 74% of respondents who self-identified as white. And looking at the racial de demographics, they align with the general overall population of Rhode Island. So when we look at the overall population, we have about 75 to 80% individuals who are white. So our survey falls in line with that. Um, we had 45% who indicated they had a college degree. So that's a pretty high number. Um, amongst this particular sample size. 57% uh, reported that they had a job so that they're employed. Um, half of the sample owned a home. Um, in terms of uh, deaf identity, we had 38% self-identifying as culturally deaf. We had 45% identifying as deaf and 18% hard of hearing. So when you take into consideration 38% and 45%, uh, we're talking over 80% of respondents identify as either deaf or culturally deaf uh, in this particular sample. 18% um, hard of hearing, we would have liked to have seen those numbers much higher considering hard of hearing folks comprise the majority of the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, of note, in terms of health outcomes, we have 34% who were classified as obese, and this is according to BMI. We had an additional 38% who uh, were considered overweight. So when we take those two percentages together, we have about 72% of respondents uh, classified as either obese or overweight. Uh, so this has implications for behavioral health. Medical conditions, uh, when we look at depression or anxiety, uh, folks who have been diagnosed with this particular condition at some point in their lives, 43% of the sample size. So quite a high number um, has been diagnosed. Um, hypertension, 34%. Arthritis, 35%. Diabetes, 26, so about a quarter of the sample size. Lung disease and asthma, 22%. Cancer, 11% liver and kidney problems, 11%, uh, heart condition, 7%, stroke, 6%, and COVID-19, 5%. Uh, we had about 35% uh, visiting the emergency department. And uh, we have, uh, let me see what else, about 95% of the sample indicated that they had some kind of insurance, whether that's private insurance or Medicaid. 89% um, reported having a regular provider, and out of that group, 38% used interpreters and 42% communicated directly, uh, either in sign language or English, while 20% used writing or texting. Um, so all of this information is broken down in greater detail on our website. Again, we hope you have the opportunity to take a look at it. Um, and this is certainly informing us of future needs for health education. Uh, health literacy, um, and that's something that we're currently working on now in our discussions with the Department of Labor and Training to see if we can um, address uh, opportunities uh, for health education in the future for the community. So I know we're past time, 501, and we need to let the interpreter go. Um, so we hope you take a look, and I guess we'll reconvene back at our next meeting. And if there's any questions, both Alex and I will be more than happy to answer. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I will definitely look at the result and um, I'll try to set up more time for the group um, sooner than a month from now to to look at the results more and potentially talk about more topics. But a big thank you to you and Alex. I did a tremendous job. Really excited about the website. Um, this is great. Uh, so I uh, definitely want to take a look at your your work and we're really excited about the workforce training module as well. Okay. All right. Um, I don't think we had anybody in the public in this meeting, so we're, we'll have that there. And then like I said, I'll schedule another time for the group to get together. And with that, um, I'll let everybody go and hope you can enjoy your night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Christine and Alex. Bye everyone. Great Thank job. You. Thank you, Boomi. Thank you.